Thank you. Wow. Um, it's really weird, that was. Um, gosh, I've got my hair tingling already all the back of my... Um, I've just left the room sort of 10, 15 minutes ago. It's all empty, and then you come back in, and there's you know, a room full of people um, with such energy, and it's brilliant. And what's lovely is the type of people that are here today, and when you get like-minded people all working together for a common goal, incredible things happen. That's what we've discovered in the, in the work that we do. I don't know, did you notice it at the wedding? Did you notice what an upbeat sort of day it was? Everyone was saying the energy. That's an example of it where you've got like-minded people working together for a common goal because we're so used to doing things you know, on our own. So um, thanks for showing up today. Come on in. We haven't really started. Just getting going. Um, I think a few people are um, finding it a bit difficult finding the venue. Apologies about the change. The Hilton in Northampton double booked us. Um, we're going to hear us talking about the script today. Well, that put me in my script, I can tell you. When, I found, when, they, when they told me that three weeks ago, we're really sorry. Um, so that's, that was the reason for the change. And um, one thing I really want to do is get rid of this, because a lectern, you've got to be kidding. So can you just give us a lift off with that? <laughs> you ain't going to get me standing with a lectern. You are with that, Tom. So, uh, and, um, we've also, um, we've got a bit of a problem with the sound system, so we've got this today here, so, um, I'm really joking. Um, what was lovely as well was hearing the laughter, and when we were out there, you could hear people laughing, um, which is an important energy. So what are we all about? You know, what, what are you here for, and, you know, what's going on? What, what's, what's going down? And I was just, um, when we were standing outside just then, you know, I got this thing, it's such a big thing about goals. We were talking about it last night, about setting goals and, and achieving goals. And um, I put, put an email out um, uh, last week, and this guy picked it up in Australia. And I was saying something like it was something, you know, um, goals bullshit or something. You know what I mean? That because what, 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 really, what a goal is for a lot of the time, it's an excuse to put your feelings on hold. That's what a goal is. When you achieve the goal, then you can be happy. And, and what we're big on is having the feelings now, not, not doing that. So I'd just like to start off with saying, you know, we're not big on setting goals. We're big on achieving them. And there's a big difference in that about the, the achieving. We are getting spectacular results. I mean, I've got massive respect for everyone in this room because there's about 50 million things that you could be doing out there now. You could be shopping. You could have had laying in bed, you know... It's umpteen things, you could be playing golf or doing whatever you do. But you know what? You're not. You're here. And for that, I've got massive respect for you. But I'm going to say something now that's quite big. And it'd be interesting to see whether you can receive what I'm going to say to you now. And that is, you're pioneers, you're leaders. You think, no, I'm not. I'm just here for the... No, no, no. No, no. Listen, listen. 99.9% .9 of the people on this planet would not choose to be here today. They wouldn't choose to be here today. They wouldn't be interested in what's going down here today. You are. For whatever reason, you showed up. And, and, and that's special. Because jeepers, people like you and people like us and people of BC, we're really needed out there in a the minute. Um, I'm an optimist, by the way. I'm not a pessimist, an optimist. And I wrote a quote in, my, in one of my books once, and it was, um, optimists have all the luck. Because we always see, you see, we think there's a reason. We actually call it in BC, we call it research. Or Simpson syndrome. I'll perhaps explain a little bit about that later. But first things first, and um, what you really need to know, you need to know a little bit about me. You need to know my story. And most people don't do that. They don't, they don't share their story. Here's an example. I'm a, 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 doing a talk when I used to do my sort of corporate talks. And um, it was an aerospace company called Talis. And I found them really intimidating. They were all ex-military people. Um, you know, they make all the, um, all the arms and things, you know, and planes and stuff. And um, I said to them, I said, I asked them a question. I said, and it's an interesting question. And I said, how important do you think respect is? I mean, like you now, do you think it's important that you respect someone in, if you're in a relationship with someone, that you respect that person? And it's a word that people don't look. You can love somebody, but not respect them. A lot of people make that mistake. 
And I asked these guys, and there was a hundred of them, the top leaders, and I said, you know, how important do you think respect is in your teams at work? You know, within your, your business, what you're doing? They said, oh yeah, and vital was the word that came back. They said respect is vital for relationships, professional or personal. I said, brilliant, I agree with that. How'd you get it? It's like, hundred. And you could have heard a pin drop. I said, you've just told me that respect is vital, right? Professionally and personally. So, you know, what's your process for getting it? And not one person out of a hundred. Come on in. Not one person out of a hundred could give me a good answer. Don't you think that is amazing? That we're saying on one hand that respect is really important, but they didn't know how to do it. I said, I can show you. I can show you now. It's ever so easy. And what I say to people, I say, shout out a name. Someone that you admire and respect. And you normally get, if it's a more spiritual group, you'll probably get Gandhi or something like that. If it's a business event, it'll probably be Richard Branson or some. And you say, okay, you respect them. Why? They go, sorry? I say, why? You just told me you respect what? Why? I say, well, you know, because of what they've done, what they've achieved. And I said, yeah, and it's the same with us. You need to know, before I get up here and start telling you about how amazing BC, what is this BC thing? Why are we getting, honestly, spectacular results? First of all, you need to know who I am, because if not, we haven't got the respect thing going. And you've got to get the respect, first of all. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to start with my story. You're going to have to get the compressed version, because you can... You can spend a long time telling your story. We do that on BC. We get people to tell a story. People say, ain't God's story. And we go, yeah, right. And then they say, oh, well, where do I start? So what's, what's one of your first memories? And they start speaking. And they finish, on average, about three quarters of an hour later. And often you have people in the room sitting there crying. You can't believe what's happened. Because I'm not big on sort of climbing mountains or swimming across rivers. You're not going to get me doing that. The biggest challenge you're ever going to have in your life is not running up Everest three times backwards or, you know, holding your breath underwater. It's getting who you are, overcoming ourselves, who we think we are. There's such an identity crisis going on, and that's what we're going to explain today. You are in a really good place. So my story, my story is this. I was born in 1949. That is a joke. That makes me 62 this year. I think I'm 22. <laughs> I mean, look at the state of these things that I'm wearing. I don't get age. I don't get it. We went out for a meal last night, you know, and um, I was saying, my dad was really old when he was my age. He's 62. I meet people that are in their 30s and I think they're old enough to be my dad or my mum. <laughs> I just don't get age. And I hope I never do. And I think that's why I've got... See, what I've got, I've got a lot of energy. And most people haven't got a lot of energy. And it's not working. So we're going to tell you all about that today. So my story, I'm born in 1949. Um, my mum came, they came over to this country in 47 because my mum was born in India. And my dad, he joined the army and, and, and went over there and, and they came about 47 and I was born in 49. And, and, and my mum was a really sensitive lady. You see, that's the big issue at the minute. What we do, we suppress our sensitivity. And you might think, oh, well, yeah, we do that. No, 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 it's killing people. It's killing people, and that's, that's my driving force for doing the work that I do. We've already got people that have said to us, if it wasn't for you, I'd be dead. If it wasn't for BC, because I know who I am now. I know what that voice is in my head. So anyway, going back to it, so my mum was sensitive. And she was so sensitive, bless her, that she had a lot of nervous breakdowns. And, and, and I can remember at a young age, going with my mum, and we got to a hospital. And I'd sit outside a room, and, and my mum sort of, she looked, she looked all right when she went in the room, but when she came out, I could tell she'd been crying and she was shaking. Do you know what they used to do to my mum? And my mum was like, she's my claim to fame. Listen to this. 
When I was a kid, I, they'll do this, by the way. I jump all over the place because I'm speaking from my heart, not for head. I get, you know, these cosmic faxes, what I call, come in. And I'll just go with the flow. And, and um, when I was a kid, I'll come back, this is part of the story. I, Beatles, I was a huge fan of the Beatles. You know, the Beatles. I mean, their music is still massive today. Imagine knowing as a kid that Ringo Starr would buy, not one, 20 of my books. That's what happened to me in my life. When David got a call in the office, and um, basically, I said, oh, it's Ringo Starr's PA. We thought, yeah, right. Yeah, of course it is. <laughs> and he wants 20 of your books, 10 of your blue ones, and he wants um, 10 of your yellow books. And it was real. And listen to this. You'll love this. So we said, would he like them signing? And like, she came back. He said, yes, please. The Beatles asked for my autograph. <laughs> that is cool. <laughs> So, so, come on in. So, why, why am I sharing that with you? Because my claim to fame is my mum. Because my mum never, ever fell out with anybody. In all her life, I never knew her to fall out with anyone, but she was sensitive. And do you know what they did in the room at the hospital? I'm not joking. They plugged her into the mains. They gave her electric shock. And someone shouted, oh, no, someone here will know. What do they call that? E ETC is it? Is, is it, David? Yeah, and, and I'm not knocking, perhaps it does help. My God, there's got to be a better way than that. Plugging someone in to the, to the, I nearly swore then, I nearly said, plugging someone into the fucking mains, <laughs> there's got to be, like, a better way than, 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 than doing that, surely. You can't say, oh, they're sensitive, plug them into the mains. No, we don't do that now. We've got another thing, haven't we? Give them Prozac or something. Numb the feelings. And, and that's what's going on at the minute. I, again, I'm not knocking the med medical profession. Perhaps in some cases, there is a need for, for, for drugs or whatever. But I reckon a vast majority of the time, it's just people suppressing the sensitivity. What we do in BC, we let that out. And people, you know, in BC, they'll say something. Here's a common one. They'll say, I... Uh, I'll be honest, I, uh, I'm sort of a bit scared that people are going to find out who I really am, going to rumble me. And someone else goes, what, you get that? And they go, yeah. And then someone else says, excuse me, so do I. And it's like you're coming out. And you see, everyone's communicating at the moment, superficial level. How are you doing? All right, not bad, whatever. We are not saying what we're really feeling. And again, that's sort of all right to the point where people are chucking themselves off buildings. That's unacceptable for me. So anyway, going back to my story, so my mum's sensitive. I, I took on that sensitivity. I'm a really, really sensitive person. And that has caused me so much pain in my life when I was younger. You can't believe it. That's why I'm so passionate about what I do. That's why I'll give you everything that I've got today. That's why BC's working. Do you know what the most common thing, what people say about this day? It was real. You're going to hear real people get up here today. It's not just about me and Liz. Liz is going to come up in a while, my partner. You're going to hear people coming up here just for sort of five, ten minutes at a time that they want to share something with you. Most, if not all of them, will be really nervous about doing that. But you know what? The message is more important. There's a thing that I've got. You know, you can, you can over, how you overcome any fear is you find a message that is greater than the fear. That's what gets me on this stage. I'm terrified of public speaking. Honestly, you think, no, you're not. I am. I'm sensitive. I am terrified of public speaking. You think, well, you seem to be making a good job of it. Yeah, that's because my message is greater than my fear. Because what we're sharing with you today nearly killed me. And it's, you know, it's nearly killed a lot of people. I don't mean just the suicide, which was my case. It's that daily grind where you get up in the morning, you think, oh, another day. You know, what's going on? What's, what's happening here? We have found a process. We found a way around that. And again, I just want to thank you for showing up today. It means so much to me. If you would have told me one day in my life that I'd be standing on a stage, you know, on this day, that predicted, projected this day in the future, and said we're going to be in a room, I just wouldn't have believed it. For a start, even if I'd have got on the stage, I wouldn't have thought anyone would be interested. But you are, because you're searching like we were searching. 
And what you want to do is what we want to do. You know what you want to do? Yeah, you want to get who you are, but correct me if I'm wrong, don't you want to make a difference? Yeah, please God you do. That's what you want to do as well. And what we've got is a system that's transferable, but I'll tell you about that later. Back to my story. So I'm sensitive. I'm so sensitive to the point that I can't go in crowded places. I'm, I'm starting to pick up a lot of my mum's symptoms. I couldn't go in assembly for three years at school. For three years at school, I was the only kid that wasn't in assembly. I'd sit. It was so quiet. Everyone was in assembly. Yeah, talk about loneliness. I was having panic attacks at a really young age. And what used to happen, this is where my panic attacks got me. I don't know if you've ever had a panic attack, but they just take you out. I just totally disable, you know, and, and I used to have this thing where I, I didn't feel that I could breathe. You know, I used to have this thing where, actually, I'll tell you what, can you get the, the photos up there, Andrew, with a part of my story, and I'll show you something. By the way, all these up here, these are the people of have BC, I've just been going on the road to thing, and some of the quotes. And, um, yeah, look, that's, <coughs> that's me. Can I do that? you got the one with the house there? See if you've got one with a house. Yeah, I'll explain that one in a minute. I've jumped forward a bit here, but that's me, the lottery winner's lifestyle. If you think I'm posing there, correct. <laughs> if you think I'm holding my tummy in there, correct. You should have seen... There was a big lump at the back. So I've got an interesting story to share with you, you know, what's happened in my life, but I was sensitive. My panic attacks would get me like this. My panic attacks would get me so I felt that I couldn't breathe. It was the equivalent of putting a plastic bag over someone's head, tying it and putting their hands... That's what it felt like. That wasn't what was happening. Can you imagine what it's like for a kid that big to think that he's dying... No one, no one, not one person told me, hey, that's all right, Richard. A lot of people have those. No one minimised it like, like me and Liz do with people. We say, hey, that's okay. Loads of people are like that. No one minimised it. No one said lots of, they're called panic attacks. They didn't, I didn't even hear that phrase as a kid. So what do you think I think then? I think that I'm dying. I think that I'm nuts. I think that I'm weird. I think that I'm crazy because no one's speaking to me on the level that we'll be speaking to you at today. And it's needed. It's got to happen. Someone's got to do it. We've got to do it. We've got to step up. And I'll tell you what, you'll have a voice in your head and it will never tell you that you're good enough. The little voice, that negative voice, what you have to do and what you learn to do is hear that voice, say, yep, yeah, and do it anyway. But we're going to explain. We're going to tell you about that voice. We're going to tell you what it is. So anyway, here I am, I'm at school, I'm having panic attacks, I can't go in assembly, I think I'm, I think I'm weird. Um, I, I, I never stayed to school dinners once. And you think, what do you mean you didn't stay to school dinners? Because it would have killed me, that's what it felt like. And you see, if you feel that, it's real to you, because you might say, well that's ridiculous. Yeah, logically, it's ridiculous. I am letting you in, my world, as a kid. I'm, in, I'm letting you see, what because once stuff's going on in your head, it will do all sorts of weird things to you. That was me. No one said anything about that I was sensitive. No one said that it was panic attacks. And that was my, that was my school days. That, that was it. I was in the, by the way, I was in the bottom class all the way through school. Absolute bottom. You couldn't get any lower than where, where we were. So actually, I'm thick. And people say, no, you're not. I am. I am. What happens is when people really get to know me after a couple of years, they'll sort of say, you know what, you are thick, aren't you? <laughs> I go, yeah. What do I mean by thick? This is what I mean by it. It's actually not a negative. I'm not putting myself down. If you base me on the, current, uh, the present sort of educational system, I'm thick because I don't hold information. I don't remember things. And most exams, as you know, it's just about being a parrot. They'll tell you a load of stuff, and then you've got to remember it. Then there's an exam, and the more accurately you can repeat what you were told, then the sort of cleverer you are. Well, you know, I can't get dementia because I was born with it. <laughs> I look in the mirror some morning and think, I know the face. <laughs> Give us a clue. But I'm still doing this. Oh, yeah, just one thing. 
I have access to genius. BC, as you get to understand BC, it is genius. Don't listen to me, listen to the people later about that. And doesn't that sound like a contradiction? I am not genius. I am not a genius. I didn't say that. I said, I have access to genius. And we were talking about this yesterday. This is a massive breakthrough that we've discovered. That you can, it's like a website, genius.com, but you've got to have the code. You've got to type the right code in to be able to access genius. And you can do that. So BC is genius. So it's such a contradiction that I'm thick, but I've got access to genius. So... I leave school, I'm 15, I've got zero qualifications, I think an O level's a blood group, and that was about as far as I got. <coughs> I went to a factory, someone with my qualifications in Northampton, just down the road, it was all boot and shoe factories, so they put me in a boot and shoe factory. And you know, the noise and the smell for someone that's sensitive. Um, anyway, I... I stuck that out for a while and I went on the building at 21, I got a job as, um, as a labourer. And I don't know do, you know, do you know what an odd is? An odd is the thing that they, I, I've never told anyone in a, I've never said this to anyone in a talk, there you go. And, and, an odd is where that thing they put on the shoulder, they put the bricks in. You know, you've got a, lot, a bit of wood down here. But what a lot of people don't know, what, a, what they call a muck odd is. What a muck art is, it's one about four times bigger that you fill up with cement. And I can remember, you fill this thing up with cement, like when I'm just on the building, and you get under it like this, like right, you lean it up against something, and you put your arm around it, and you stand up, but it's this great big thing. I couldn't, I couldn't even stand up with it. I was going, oh shit. Then you've got to carry it, and then you've got to climb a ladder. You know, because there was no sort of health and safety stuff, like, you know, that caps and everything. I stuck it out, and um, <coughs> by the age of 27 on the building, I got my own company. And um, I can tell you how, obviously, I know how to make money, because I got, you know, that was my mansion and everything that, that I bought, because I was just brought up in the, on the council estate. And, and it's, it's one word, encouragement. It's encouragement. I'm good at encouraging people. Most people are not. Um, it never ceases to amaze me with a lot of people, how tactless they are. I hear people hit out with such, you know, think, oh, you cringe. We always get the best service wherever we go, because we encourage people. Oh, thanks very much, it's great, it's amazing. I can't just say thank you. I say it's brilliant. I mean, last night we had a, we had a meal. And before we'd finished, this lady, she'd got a little CD on BC that had served us, and she knows that we're here today. You know, I, I just got a love, I got a love of people. I got a love of people. And, and, and people like me, so what happened was, they, they would say to me on the building, um, Richard, you know, um, you know, your boss is all sort of, you know, he's, he's, you know, he's never got to learn dirty do. So you don't, you don't know anyone that could build a little wall for me, could you? So, well, I, could, I know someone that can. I'd put 10 quid on it and get someone. Hey, I don't 10 quid for nothing. Next, it was a roof. And then one day, this guy says, look, I know someone that's got this pub. It's a brewery. I want some work doing. And I did that. And the next minute, I'm refitting all these pubs. I've got 40 people working for me. None of it was planned. I didn't have a goal. I didn't have a goal where I'm going to live. And that's what I said. I achieve goals. I don't make them. It's depressing making goals all the time and thinking, I'll be happy when. Do you know... I was asked to do a talk in a company. I was actually asked to do a talk in a company. And they said, Richard, you know, we want you to do your talk. It's just one thing. It's a multi-level marketing company. And they've actually gone bust now. It's not surprising. And they said, just one thing. Can you not tell people they can be happy now? <laughs> I said, I'm sorry. I said, we want people to want the goals. Then they'll be happy. This is true. Ask Liz, because she, she overheard the conversation. I said... I hear what you're saying, I said, you do realise there's no way I can do your talk now. And he said, what do you mean? He said, no, no, okay, say it then if you want. So, no, no, it's all right, yeah, I've already made my mind up now. And we really needed the money at that time. We really needed the money, but I couldn't do it, because it conflicted with my values. Because you've just got a guy here now, standing in front of you, that wants to share something that you can help other people with. It was never in my plan to stand on a stage. It was never in my plan to, to have the mansion. But anyway, back to the story. So, um, 
27, I've got my own building company, that's me at 37. Um, I've got a mansion, I've got my first um, Ferrari. Could you just flick it for us, please, Andrew? And then you see, um, I've got, I got loads of them. Um, it wasn't just being flashed, the first one was being flashed. The flash one was the, um, I think it's the one in the middle. I wanted a Ferrari, but then I got it and it went up 15,000. For driving a Ferrari, it went up 15,000. I thought I'd get another one. And that went up 30,000, and that's what I started doing. I was investing in cars, and there's one. Could you just put the other one up, Andrew? There's one. That, I was on Top Gear the other day. That's a Porsche 959. I paid £350,000 for that. Third of a million for a Porsche 959. So it all seems good. You know, kid from the council estate makes it good, living in his mansion and everything. Uh-uh. See, um, I, haven't got my little <coughs> I haven't got my little badge on. Um, I've got one somewhere. Let's put it on here. We've got these badges. I'm, I'm there. And, and, and that's what I was looking for. I was trying to get there. Everyone wants to get there. And I thought if I got the mansion... Can you put the mansion up again, please? I thought if I got the mansion and all the stuff... See, this is the 80s, all right? This is Maggie Thatcher time, and that was the script. We're going to explain the script today. That was the script that I got that said, be successful. Get a lot of big cars, get a big house, make a shitload of money. But you know what? I wasn't there. Do you know where I was? You relate to this. I was nearly there. You can relate to that, can't you? You bet you were nearly there. Most people are. Most people think, I am so nearly there. I just want to get enough money, just pay for the house, just sort the kids out, you know what I mean? Or just sort me out, and you go through life, and I just sort them, until one day you go, just sort this, and you look, and you think, shit, it's the end of my life. Nim. <laughs> That's it. What you should see on every headstone is, here is Fred Smith, he was nearly there. <laughs> and you know, I've never seen in a graveyard ever in my life, and I'm going to have this on my grave. I'm going to have this on my tombstone, I think. Hopefully not today. He was there. He found it. And I did. I didn't find it in that. I've never met anybody that's found it in that. We were talking about, that's a bullshit story. It's a bullshit story that something happens on the outside and it allows you to have a feeling on the inside. That's what most people are doing out there. That's why they wouldn't be in this room today. They're not interested in what you're interested in. They want more stuff. So they're out there getting more stuff. But it's only because they want to get there. That's what they want. And we play the game. Just one little thing. We use our lives up doing it. We use our lives up doing it. So that was me. So that's me living there. I've got three children, three sons, three older sons. I've been married twice. I don't, I don't do... Um, I don't do any work on relationships because that's not really an area that I've been successful in. I've been married three times. But what, what we do do in the work we do, if you're interested in raising your consciousness, if you're interested in helping yourself, in other, other people, excuse me, I can really help there, massively. And do you know how I know that? Do you know where my absolute certainty comes from? Not from me. It's from the other people that are in this room and some of the people that will be sharing this stage. That's, that's where I've got it from. Because BC has been running for four years. How can I not stand up here and give you everything that I've got? And I mean everything when I've got people coming up to me that did it four years ago saying it's stronger now than what it was when I did it. You don't need that out there. And see, I was thinking the other day, like personal development. Most people in this room would have done a lot of personal development. And like me, you've probably noticed, you know people that have read all the books, you know, they've listened to all the CDs, been all, all sorts of workshops, and they're more screwed up than ever. And you get them, I see them, they analyse, well, isn't that a... And they're just totally in the head. They've gone nuts, yes, yeah, like, whoa, and it's, it's sort of, you know... And do you know what most personal development is? Because BC isn't really personal development. And personal development isn't people-friendly, a lot of it. Because you do the course and you can guess what, I've done it, and people are going, whoa. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's not. Listen to this. 40% of the people that have done BC are partners. We've got people that are putting their kids on BC. Well, don't you get it? Don't you get it? You know what family's like to convince. It's the worst. 
I think it's even in the Bible, you can't be a prophet in, in your own land. Family is the worst. They are going to be the biggest resistance. And we've got people that are seeing the change in their family are saying, I'm going to do it. I've never done a course before. Some have done lots of personal, some other, for, only for one reason, they've seen the change in other people, because it works. That's what, if you're interested in results, then you're in the right place. So anyway, I'm living in my mansion. What I didn't know was there was a divorce around the corner. Um, I, wasn't a, I wasn't a good husband. I was unfaithful to my wife. I don't need to tell you that bit, but I feel I ought to, because it's no point in me coming up here. I am not somebody that's happy and positive all the time. I'm not. I'm real. I always say to people, come and spend a week with me, and you'll be so fucking disappointed. And you think, well, what's this day about then? Isn't it about us being happy and pot? No, no, that's not what we've told you. We, we want real. We want real. And, I, you know, I explain more about that as the, as, as the day goes on. It's, it's phen- honestly, it's phenomenal what we got. It really is. So, um, yeah, I was, un- I was unfaithful. There was a divorce. Not normal. You don't have a normal divorce when you've got a lot of money. You don't get solicitors, you get barristers. She's got a private detective on me and all this stuff is horrible. And then a year later, so my company now, I've borrowed a lot of money and invested a lot to fund the divorce, to give my wife, luckily she got, you know, she was only 29, I managed to buy a great big four-bedroomed house without a mortgage at 29. And people say, well, you know, aren't you sort of bitter that that happened because I ended up losing everything? I said, no, I was so pleased that she was able to take something from it. And then it, it came on the news one day, stock market crash. I mean, that was a proper recession, not like this one. We just, we're talking interest rates 16%. You're stuffed. Everybody's stuffed then. And it was interest rates 16%. Bank called me in. I was dreading it. I said, Richard, you, you're in trouble. I said, uh, I said, yeah, I know. And they said, uh, you've got to sell. Because what happened, you see, borrowing went up and interest rates... And the values came down. That's what happened in the recession. It's not like the values stay where they are. Because you can't sell. So that's where, if the values stayed the same, you'd have been all right. Just the interest. But you're not coping with that. So the values of your assets, the properties, the cars and everything, are going down. So I've got a lot of property. And I said, um, no, no. If you, you make me sell now, I'm wiped out. I'm finished. Because, you see, if you sell in the middle of a recession, everybody knows you're in trouble. And it's like um, a shark attack, a feeding frenzy, piranha, they all, that's what happened. That has just sold, that house, for just short of five million. It was on the market um, last week. Um, I believe the people that are buying it, the people that had the, Doc Martin shoes. Um, five million. I got 400,000 for it. I was just 3.6 million down on that, 4.6, sorry. I told you I was thick. <laughs> Actually, it is lovely. When you're thick, it is great. Because someone says, well, you just messed that up. I said, yeah, I told you I was thick. <laughs> so I do. I don't, don't defend it. It's great. It's great being thick. So anyway, um, yeah, I, I, I sold. I sold everything. And I was wiped out. But I was one year away from retirement. I was going to retire at 41. I got it all planned out. I got my plan. I got my goals. I've got a golf course. I've got a planning consent for an 18-hole golf course. That's what I was going to do. And um, I'm going to convert my stable block into offices. Now, I'm laying in bed and I think, man, I had a dream that I lost everything living in a bed set. And I was. It was a nightmare. I lost, I lost, I lost my home. I went personally bankrupt because what I did, I gave personal guarantees. That's what you did in the recession because you didn't think it was going to last. You think, I'm not going to let the business go, so you keep putting more and more money in. So I went bankrupt, I lost my company, I lost my home. Through the divorce, I lost my family. My lovely mum died. She died when when I was 22. And um, I didn't cope with that very well because, again, no one told me how to cope with things like that. No, No one had told me how to cope. Do you know what they do at the moment with coping? Do you know what people do? If their kids, their teenage kids are struggling, 
Do you know what? There's two things I normally do. There's two things. The first one is cheer up. It's not that bad. You're lovely. You're a wonderful person, you are. If I don't cheer up and it gets worse, the second thing that's normally done out there, say so you want to go to the doctors. Then they put them on Prozac. And Lizzie's going to talk to you about identity. You know two of the most dangerous words you can say is, I am. So people go to the doctors, you know, um, someone came to see me, say I'm here like, you know, I'm like Dr. Wilkins, right? I'm quite short really, aren't I? <laughs> And you come and see me in my surgery, and you say, uh, I say, how are you doing? I say, uh, not, not very good, really. No? Oh, what's the matter? I say, well, yeah. I keep having these real ups and downs. Do you know what I'd say? So do I. Everybody does. But we've got an explanation for that. We're saying that's when you're in your script and you're out your script. What do you think a doctor says? Do you think a doctor says, oh, that's just your script, let me explain that. And I'm not knocking doctors, right? They're doing a fantastic job, but I think on average, they've got, what is it, seven minutes per patient? On average in the national health system. So they go, ooh, that don't sound very good. What, so it's right up and right then, yeah. So, ooh, God. Um, sounds like you could be bipolar. What do you think happens to someone, right? Everyone that's classed as bipolar on medication that, that would have been the first time they told they were bipolar. What do you think that they went and did once they said the doctor said, I'm bipolar? You went and got your prescription. People say, how would you get a doctor? You say, I am bipolar, right? So you say, I am, your behaviour will follow what you believe yourself to be. Look out. Do you know what the first thing people will do? You know what they'll do. They'll get their computer and they'll Google it. Bipolar. And it'll say, bipolar. What happens when you've got bipolar? Um, your head twitches three times, like that. Say it did. I guarantee you, within an hour, they'd be going, oh God, there it goes. <laughs> but you're only doing what you should be doing. I am bipolar. I do what a bipolar. Say they sort of skip. Every, then you'd be, I bet within an hour, they'd be going down the road. They'd be skipping. Because I am, I am bipolar. You know, I've got, a, I've got an email there. You know, what am I supposed to do? This week, from a guy... There's been, it's been in AA for 16 years. And he sees our video on YouTube at the sausage machine. He said, I've got it. I said, I've got it. Because what they say in AA, and it's wonderful work they do in AA, but they're still saying, I am an alcoholic, when you're trying to move away from that. <laughs> I am an alcoholic, so your behaviour follows it. Rather than, we would change it ever so slightly and say, I have the behaviour of an alcoholic, listen to this, it's really important, when I'm in my script. And I'll explain about the script thing in a minute. So I don't know where we were with the story, but I lost everything. Yeah, and I, I, wh where do you go? You're just about to retire. I've got no money, no job, no home, no mum. No dad, no family to talk to. So you know when they like, you know, put on the flip chart on the stress scale, number two, you know, the stress factor is like, you know, moving house. <laughs> Try losing house. Losing family, losing money, losing your marbles. Because it all went. And I had what, what we know today is, I guess, a breakdown. I just couldn't cope. Whoa. I didn't eat for three weeks. I don't know if it was three weeks or five weeks. I can't remember. And you think, well, like, you were dying. No, no. Now, what I did, I couldn't eat anything solid because I just kept rocking like that. I felt sick all the time. And I, I used to drink this um, powdered um, food. That's the only thing that my stomach could, could take. Because, you see, no one told me how to deal with it. No one had told me. We've got a system now that can help people like that. The only reason people listen to me is because they know the shit that I've been through. If you have ever had shit in your life, if you have still got shit in your life, and I hope you have because you need to be real, then it's fantastic because that's what people want to know. People do not want to hear you come up here and say, oh, I'm always happy and positive. I'm never down. You think bully for you. <laughs> that's what people still do that on stages. People will come up here and they'd get a flip chart and they'd tell you what you already know. You know what to do. That isn't your issue. You know it's about 
correct me if I'm wrong, isn't it about tomorrow, if you could wake up, wouldn't you like to appreciate the small things more, not take things for granted, you'd, you'd like not to, to worry as much as you do and be more upbeat and, and love yourself? What's the point in me? We won't do that today. I'm not going to waste my time and your time telling you things that you already know. That's not the issue. The issue is this. And it's a quote that we did. Our greatest, our, our greatest frustration, it isn't that we don't know what to do. It's knowing exactly what to do and still not doing it. That's the challenge. Why don't we do it? And that's what we're going to explain today. Because most of the time, we're not choosing. And personal development told me the opposite. He said, you choose to be happy, you choose to be sad. You think, brilliant, I'm going to choose to be happy. You do the workshop, happy, happy, I'm going to be happy. And you get a phone call and it's bad news. So I don't care, I'm going to be happy, happy. I'm going to be, I'm not going to get, let it get to me. Do you know what that is? Pressure. And it ain't bloody real, you like it, doesn't it? You've all done that, where so it says you choose to be happy, you choose to be sad. No, you don't. You don't choose to be sad. Look, there's happy, there's sad. I bet you I could go around everyone in the room if we've got enough time. Which would you choose? Not what you're doing. Forget what you're doing. What would you choose to do? There's happy, there's sad. How many people would go, oh, I'll have a bit of sad, please? A <laughs> bit more crap. You know, happy or crap. Oh, crap. I'll have some crap. <laughs> you don't choose it. We do it. The difference is massive. This is where we've had a breakthrough in, in the work that we do. BC isn't a copy of anything else. I'll tell you what, I think I've got it. I don't know if you're enjoying this, but I am, by the way. Um, it's real. Look, it's all heading somewhere today. The reason I'm sharing my story with you is that we need to, we need to have this respect going on, this mutual thing. And, and people don't do that. They, they come up here and they hide behind a flip chart. They hide behind this thing, whatever it is they're doing in personal development or, or whatever. All personal development is well-intentioned. It's just that most of it, I said, I've asked me, it doesn't last. You get the high, the euphoric thing, then it's downhill. We do the opposite. It starts there and it goes up. So anyway, just to put your mind at rest, in case you're th sitting, you might be thinking, what is this? What am I here for? Right, what it isn't, and I'm not knocking any of these, there's some good stuff, but it isn't NLP, if you're thinking, well, is this? A lot of people that have done BC, that have done NLP. Someone once said that um, BC is for the heart, what NLP is for the head. That's how someone summed it up, I don't know. Um, it isn't personal development, it isn't hypnosis, it isn't a quick fix that doesn't last. Actually, it's a quick fix that does last. And you think, no, it's not, you can't have a quick fix, yeah, yeah. That's, if you listen to the people that have done it, yeah, you're saying in five days you can totally change someone's life. And how we do it, because you think, well, we've heard that before about changing someone's life. No, we work on the level of identity, not behaviour. That's how we do it. Um, anyway, um, it isn't about positive thinking. It isn't about willpower. It isn't about goal setting. It isn't about the past. It isn't about exercises. It isn't about doing. It isn't rah-rah. Um, it isn't a copy of something else. It isn't a false promise. We're not a cult. People think we're a cult because we hug, right? That's, that's a common one. You guys are a cult. And do you know the last one, and I think this is so true, it's not for everybody. We don't want people coming along if they're saying, oh, I don't think this is going to work for me. I, I, we did a day like this, and a lady came up to me at lunchtime. She said, it won't work for me, you know. I said, you're right. And she's waiting for me to say something else. She said, well, are you going to say something? I said, no. That's it. It's not. We're, we're not here to convince you. I wouldn't insult you. We do, that's why I said, I'm not going to give you a lot of information. We're information dealt. The thing is, why aren't we using what we already know? You know enough. You know enough. It's about that activation. Because, you know, I, as, I, as I woke up, you know, I'm, I'm still, still in my story here, I wanted to find out. And I'd go, you know, I'd go and listen to people, the best speakers in the world. I spent three weeks on an ashram. No, I didn't. I went out there for three weeks. I only lasted three days because I couldn't stand it. Do you know why I couldn't stand it? There was thousands. I don't know if you've heard. He died. His name was Sai Baba. And I went out there to see what was happening. Do you know what was happening? It was just like the wedding the other weekend. It wasn't the wedding that made it special. It was the people. It was so many, a million people, all waving their little flags and all enjoying themselves and family. It was the people, it was the same on the ashram. 
they said the, the guru, you know, he was like the, you know, the master and everything. And no, it was the people that was making it all happen. So many people, and I couldn't, I said, I've got to go. And they said, no, you can't. We're out here for three weeks. I said, I'm going to Mysore and I'm going to have a beer. You know, because they're all dressed in white and, 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 and everything. And, and, and what no one told me, all these speakers, they all identified the issues. They'd say, it's about being more consciousness. Go, yeah, I could have that. You know, it's about being this, more about being that. Do you know what? Not one of them gave me the how. No one gave me something. He said, if you do this, this and this, I 100% guarantee that it will work. And if it doesn't work after five days, I'll give you all your money back, the whole thing. No one ever said that to me. They were all telling me what I should be doing. No one gave me the how. We got the how. We found the how. That's why we're so excited about it. That's why we run four of these events a year. That's what we do. And it'll get bigger and bigger because people will start using BC in sport. They'll start using it in companies and it'll get out there. And you know why they will? Because it gets results. That's the whole thing. I've only got five minutes. I've got five minutes left. So just to finish my story off then. Um, basically what happened is that, um, yeah, I lost a lot. Um, I got to the point where I, was, I just didn't want to live anymore. I know how someone can take their own life. And I tell you what, it becomes easy. It becomes easier not to be here than be here. That's how it happens. And that's what happened to me. Now, just in case at this point, if you're wondering, right, basically, you know, if I did commit suicide, no, I didn't, just to, let, you know, just to line it up a bit there. What happened, basically, was that I overheard a conversation when I was in this suicidal state, and the irony was, it was my ex-wife, she said, oh, Paul, he'll get there one day. I thought, there, how... Shouldn't I have been there when I got that? Because that's what everyone had told me. When you got enough, and then I thought, no, I've got kids. No, still, it's lovely, I, I, didn't, I wouldn't say I'm there, because, oh my God, I've never met anyone that's there. No one's ever come up to me in my whole life and said, I'm there. So are we all wasting our time? You know, is it just a total waste of time, what we're doing, trying to get there, if no one can get there? So I went out in search of there. I went looking for it. I found it. I found there. And it was that night, and I, I went home. I would started writing things down on bits of paper. And I wrote this thing, thought, there. And, and, and I wrote it, and then I read it back, and I thought, oh my God, that's brilliant. And it was a poem, I'll perhaps read it later, it's in, it's in one of my books. And the next day, I went to my family and I showed my family. You see, what I realised in this night was, all I was doing that for, I wanted a feeling. I wanted to feel successful. I wanted to feel good. I wanted to feel wealthy. I wanted to feel valued. I wanted to feel loved. They were all feelings. And I thought, but I don't feel them now, I feel shit. I feel suicidal. So where are they? Where are these feelings? I thought, oh my God. This, this is true, this is what happened to me. And one night I thought, feelings can't come from that. A feeling can't jump out of a house or a car or a thing or even another person. What happens is the feelings come, they come from us, yeah. So that means that those feelings are in me now, but I'm not accessing, they're in me now. I couldn't feel them, but they're in me now. And it was like, oh my God. Oh my God. So I'm complete. I am wealthy, because it's a feeling. I am successful. And I just let them out. I thought, fuck it. <laughs> we call it the fuck it attitude. So fuck it. So I go and see my family the next day. I said, I've got something to read you. They said, what's happened? Because I'm looking, last time they see me, I'm suicidal. I said, listen, listen, listen. And I read them this poem, it's called There. And, and they said, that's brilliant, where'd you get it? I said, I wrote it. I said, but you can't write it, you're thick. I said, no, no, but. <laughs> I said, guess, guess what? So they said, what? I said, I'm there. And they went, of course you are. <laughs> You'll be fine. 20 years ago, that was. And I ain't gone back. Do I have down days since then? Yeah. I've had black times since? Yeah. Yeah. 
But I am there, so are you. Everybody is. What I mean by there is, any feeling that you want is inside you now. I would respect it. If you come up to me to now and say, I hear what you're saying, the feeling, I feel like I'm shit. I feel like my life, someone's, someone's cheated on me. Do you know what I'd say? I'd say, would you choose to feel how you're feeling? No, I wouldn't choose it, but I feel, it's not, forget. Would you, you told me you feel shit. Would you choose to feel shit? There's shit, there's happy. Would you choose shit? And they go, well, no, I wouldn't choose it. And guess what? You're not choosing. You just told me that. And, then, and, and that's where everything sort of changed four years ago. But just to sort of just pop back into my story, um, I, um, I did my first talk um, sometime after that, a couple of years. I never arranged my talk. I never thought I was good enough. It was a surprise. Someone sprung a trap on me. They got some people in the room and they invited me along. And I, I just read a couple of poems then. And, and, and when I looked up, so many people in the room were crying and coming up and hugging me. And I said, because I was still very raw then. I said, I don't get it. Why are you all coming up to me saying it's made such a difference? It's my story. That's my story. And do you know what I said? It's your story, but we've got the same feelings. We want to get there as well. You know, we want, we want, this, we want access to these feelings. And um, I've got to sort of finish off this bit now. Um, but my life changed, and um, I was a bit ahead of the time then. I was talking about inspiration. Everyone was talking motivation. They didn't realise, of course, that you can't, you can't keep motivation going without inspiration. And they're realising it now. And um, I developed a successful speaking career. Here, I've spoken in other countries. I've spoken to a lot of people on TV and all sorts of stuff. But there was still something missing. Would you believe it? I talk about that like I'm talking about it now. And everyone says, oh, it's brilliant. Yeah, you're right with the feelings. You're right about that. But they go away and they wouldn't do anything. And it was four years ago that I realised... And what Liz and I worked out was, what stands between you and the feelings you want is a script. Like, you've got a script, right? And we've got this script, and that's what's standing between you and what you want. And this script is what you inherited. You didn't choose it. The script is what we got from our parents, our peers, and our teachers. And this says, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but it's not that easy. You can't... See, every line in the script starts with, yeah, but... You go, yeah, but it's not that easy for me. Yeah, but you don't know. Whatever, whatever. But if you could choose, you would choose to be an incredible, awesome person. But we don't. We walk out there and nothing changes, and that's okay. But it's only because of the script, because you're not choosing. That's what we're going to talk to you more about. So when I want to come up here again later. I'm going to come up again later. I'm going to tell you, you know, more about this. And this, four years ago, changed the whole thing. Because you think, why do I keep choosing to do this? You don't, it's the script. And we're just getting spectacular results. So I just want to do one thing before we finish off. I'm, we're, we're big into exercises, right? Um, and I run marathons, right? You've got to be joking, <laughs> right? But I've got an exercise. I know some of you have done it, but I still want you to do it again because it's great. So this is what we call the BC exercise. It's very short. Everyone stand on their feet, please. Every, we want 100% participation, please, us will pick on you. Right, I just want you to do that several times, like that, there. Okay, sit down, end of exercise. <laughs> what happens is, you wake up tomorrow morning and you do that, and if you can't feel a box, any wood, a coffin, it's a good day. <laughs> it's cool, no wood. There's no wood in my life. That's me for now, we're over to the amazing, I'm going to be back in a while. See you later, guys. Thank you.